Welcome back to the Center for Geospatial Analytics Compelling Research Presentations video series. This video, video 5, is your master class. Videos 1 through 4 in this series covered basic concepts such as understanding your audience and telling a story, as well as tips for delivering and preparing a research presentation, including a virtual one. In this master class video, we'll cover techniques that can help you to craft a truly outstanding and perhaps even award-winning research talk. These include show and tell, create expectations, dive deep and surface, and say it again. Let's start with show and tell. It is so important that your audience is able to follow your talk, both by listening to the words that you say and by looking at visuals on your slides which means that you must have great visuals that literally illustrate what you are saying. You may have noticed that throughout this video series, I am using very few words on screen, including only key phrases that I want you to focus on. That's really the most text that you should show on your slides. Key phrases, names or places, important numbers, things that it's important for your audience to see written out and not just hear, to make sure without a doubt that they understand what they are. Otherwise, it doesn't have to be on your slide. And I know that this is really common advice, but it is essential, especially in an online environment. Your slide should not be blocks of text, and your audience should not have to read anything that's on your slide that you don't talk about. Instead, you should use images that serve as a visual roadmap and conceptually convey what you're talking about. Bottom line, your slides should take your audience by the figurative hand. Hey, look, let me show you what I'm talking about. And there really is a scientific basis for this. Humans process written words and spoken words in the same part of our brains. So we literally cannot read and listen at the same time without getting cognitive overload. However, we process words and images in different parts of our brain. So an image can be a really effective and memorable way to support what you have to say. What might this look like in an actual research presentation? I want to share a few slides with you from a talk I gave when I was a PhD student and won first place at an ornithology conference. This slide on the left is the first slide after my title slide, where I just started introducing my topic. Imagine a typical migratory flight of a songbird, where the bird is on a stopover site before migration, makes a migratory flight, and then lands somewhere else. Birds do this many, many times during the course of a migration. I next introduced my hypotheses on this same slide, but I want you to pay attention to the fact that I set up these symbols about before a flight and after a flight here, creating a theme that I would use through the rest of my talk in the methods, the results, and the conclusions to remind people about the different aspects of my study. On the right are a couple of my method slides where I talked about my study species, where they were flying to and from, and a very simple primer on my sampling protocol. I also used these bird images throughout the rest of my talk in the results and the conclusions so that people would remember which species I was talking about. Keep in mind also that I brought bits of these slides in a little at a time using simple slide animation to keep my audience from getting ahead of me and to make sure that I walked them through everything as it appeared. So what are the take home messages here? As much as possible, use symbols, graphics, and short phrases to make your points. Essentially, break free of the bullet. Now I'd like to take a moment to just focus on this graphic in the middle in particular as an example of how to make images work for you and replace text that you might otherwise be tempted to put on the screen. This is an image that I had seen in a magazine and chose to use when I wanted to explain the breeding and wintering range of the black pole warbler, one of my study species, and its unique migration route out over the Atlantic Ocean. Most birds do not do that. And how much energy it takes for a bird to make that flight, about 11 grams of fat, or one scoop of Ben & Jerry's ice cream. I simply explained the image for my audience, just like I did for you now, and it summarized the information perfectly, so I wasn't tempted to put any of that information on my slide. Now I had another study species that breeds in the same place, but migrates very differently. 
So all I did was layer a couple of images and an arrow over that existing map to make that point. Lastly, I added a marker for where my study area was, where I actually netted those birds during the migration season to take blood samples and let them go. So the take home message from this example really is to make sure that your visuals are clear, large and high resolution, that they are supporting the story that you are telling and that they actually replace words that you might have been tempted to put on your screen. I also highly encourage the use of slide animation that you layer information to bring it in a little bit at a time to tell that visual story and keep your audience right along with you the whole way without getting ahead of you. Another feature of a really compelling talk is to create expectations for your audience, and then importantly, to meet those expectations. An audience likes to know where a story is going. This has to do with storytelling technique for sure, but it also has to do with giving signposts that lets the audience know what to expect and where they are in the story. First of all, I recommend spilling the beans with a clear and informative title for your talk. Your story will still be about solving a mystery because you're describing to your audience how you found something out, but I find it's best to present the take-home finding right at the start. This is the first slide of that award-winning talk that I've been showing you. It states exactly what I found. Migrating birds on stopover, prepare for and recover from oxidative challenges posed by long distance flight. My story was how I found that out what evidence I could provide to support that claim. Another way to create expectations is to let the audience continuously know where you are and what's next and remind them about where you've been. You may have noticed that in this video series, I set your expectations by telling you at the start what topics we were going to cover. And I've used those same symbols on each of my slides as a signpost to indicate where we are. I've featured that symbol alongside a dynamic series of arrows that show what we've already covered, where we are now, and what's next. I call this a flow device. I like using them because they remind me where I am in a talk, but they also help the audience to follow along and anticipate what's coming next. I had seen someone do that at a conference a long time ago, and I thought it was a really neat tool. So what might setting expectations with a flow device look like in a research talk? The sky's the limit, really, in terms of how you design one. As an example, though, here's that intro slide that I showed you before with a flow device up at the top. Here, my keywords are designed to look like tabs on each slide. And here's an example from my master's thesis defense presentation about a ruffed grouse study. You can see that the flow device looks a bit like an expandable drop-down menu to help keep track of a multi-scale research project. There are many ways to design a flow device. Any way that you do it, I recommend using the Slide Master feature in PowerPoint or Theme Builder in Google Slides to create your own custom slide layouts to keep the flow device consistent across slides. With your custom layouts, you don't have to copy and paste and reformat the flow device onto individual slides because you've essentially created your own template. Another advantage of a flow device is that can help you to avoid the temptation of including an outline slide in your presentations. Research presentations usually have the same basic structure, intro, methods, results, conclusions. And so not only is the outline a waste of your precious time, it's not telling the audience anything they don't already know. I used essentially an outline slide in this video series to set your expectations because there was no established framework for how I might organize or present the information I wanted to share with you. And I wanted you to know the scope of what we were going to cover. I think you'll agree this was a special circumstance. So I strongly suggest that you do not use an outline slide in your research talk, unless it is specifically strategic for you to do so. Another helpful trick for creating expectations is to create parallels in your talk. If you're going to show a result later in your presentation, show your hypotheses first and use the same type of figure that will appear later. Here again is that same slide that I've been showing you. And now here it is with it all fleshed out. Imagine that I used animation to bring in each of these graphs one at a time. 
because that is exactly what I did at the conference. Each of these graphs corresponds to three hypotheses. Now, it's not important for you to know what those hypotheses were, unless you're really interested in bird migration physiology. But the point is that I first used images instead of words on screen to illustrate my hypotheses. And second, that I created those hypothetical graphs because I wanted my audience to be ready for the results that I would show them with the real data. Here now are some of my results. You'll see that in this before migration period, I predicted a positive relationship between antioxidant capacity and fat and a positive relationship between oxidative damage and fat. And that's exactly what the real data show for both of my study species in that before time period. Now it's probably very clear from these results and from your own science that a talk can quickly turn very technical. How do we manage that technicality without losing anyone in our audience? For that, all during your talk, you're going to take deep dives into the technical aspects of your science, and then to keep your audience from drowning, you're going to repeatedly come up for air. I first heard this phrase, take deep dives and then come up for air, from a science communication professional named Melissa Marshall, who has given several talks here at NC State and who gave a very popular TED talk called Talk Nerdy to Me. And it all has to do with satisfying the members of your audience who care about the technical details of your science without losing or confusing or boring people who either don't care about those details or don't have a clue what you're talking about when you bring them up. In a nutshell, Melissa Marshall suggests deep dives into the what of your talk, those fine points about your science, and then coming up for air with a statement about the so what, which means that each time you introduce a concept that would be interesting or noteworthy to only a fraction of your audience, you immediately say why it matters or what everyone should focus on about it, and that keeps everyone following along. Essentially, return to points of common ground. As Melissa Marshall says, to satisfy audiences of different technical backgrounds. And you're going to do this multiple times during your talk. I'll give you an example. Two of the chemicals that I measured in the blood samples of the birds in my study were beta-hydroxybutyrate and triglycerides. When I introduced these compounds, I literally said to my audience, all you need to remember about these is that beta-hydroxybutyrate levels signal fat breakdown during exercise or fasting, and high triglyceride levels signal fat uptake and deposition during feeding. Now, all ornithologists who care about migration care about fat, because fat is the main source of energy for migrating birds. Remember that graphic about the black pole warbler and the scoop of Ben and Jerry's? Birds need fat to migrate. My audience for this talk, however, were mainly field ornithologists, not chemists or physiologists, and I did not expect them to be familiar with the particular fat-related compounds that were part of my chemical analyses. I saw expressions of relief on the faces of my audience when I told them what I wanted them to focus on. They were glad to know that I was not going to drown them in the details of my lab work or ask them to remember new terms. But at the same time, it was important that I not talk down to anyone in my audience who might care about what particular chemicals I was testing for in the blood samples of these birds. When I got to the results section, I again said to my audience, I am reminding you here with the box arrows that beta-hydroxybutyrate is a signal of fat breakdown and triglycerides are a signal of fat uptake. I was able to show a technical detail of my work but I made sure that everyone knew what it meant. Another thing I want to mention here is that I always walk my audiences through every figure, including axes and what they represent, and symbology, and the take-home trends. And I suggest that you do the same, because this is the first time your audience has seen this figure, and they have a limited amount of time to absorb it before you move on. Again, slide animation, bringing in info a little bit at a time can help you here. As an audience member myself, I always wish speakers would walk me through their figures in detail or tell me what is most important about them. All right, we are down to the last tip in the masterclass, 
say it again. A common rule of thumb is that it takes a person three times hearing something to really remember it. And people are usually more likely to remember the first things you tell them and the last. So there is nothing wrong and everything right with a little healthy repetition. One of my favorite things that my PhD advisor ever said was tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. For example, if you showed us some hypotheses to test at the beginning of your talk, remind us what those hypotheses were when you get to the end of your talk. Here in these slides, I've restated, yes, in words this time, what my hypotheses were and what their implications would have been. So the what and the so what, I'm doing a deep dive and resurfacing very quickly with each of these hypotheses. And then I've indicated whether they were supported or not with a simple check mark or an X. Lastly, leave your audience with a memorable take home message. People in my audience laughed at this picture. And then restate your most important findings very simply at the very end. Remember, a research presentation is your opportunity to share your latest, greatest research with your audience and to make a positive impression on them. And the best way I've found to make that positive impression is to make sure that you help your audience as much as you can to understand. Keeping all of these things in mind will help you on your way. Thanks for watching.